And greetings, everyone. Welcome to Room 42. I'm Liz Fraley from Single Sourcing Solutions. I'm your moderator. This is Jana Summers from TC Camp. She's our interviewer. And welcome to Dr. Clay Spinuzzi, today's guest in Room 42. Clay Spinuzzi is a professor of rhetoric and writing at the University of Texas at Austin. He studies how people organize, communicate, collaborate, and innovate at work. He's conducted multiple workplace studies, resulting in several articles and four books, Tracing Genres Through Organizations from MIT Press in 2003, Network from Cambridge University Press in 2008, Topsite 2.0 from Urso Press in 2018, and All Edge from University of Chicago Press in 2015. He blogs at spinuzzi.blogspot.com. Today, Clay is here to help us start answering the question, How do we use qualitative data studies and relationship modeling to better understand our audiences? Welcome. Thank you very much. We are very excited to have you here and very interested to talk to you about Topsight, what it is and how you get there, and and to talk about your book. Now, I've been going through your book and I've been reading through it, and it is rich. I feel like I've been on a journey inside your book. <laughs> oh, good. And, and I, like, I like your approach because it kind of takes us out, out of the typical, how do I say, uh, researcher kind of mode and into an investigative. So what inspired you to take that approach? Because I found that very refreshing and I like the Scooby-Doo reference. Yeah, well, of course. You know, the the thing is, I, I, well, where do I start? Okay, let me talk to you about when my life changed, which was okay. 1997. Uh, I, I was a PhD student at Iowa State University, and I really wanted to get more research experience. And that's partially because I wasn't sure if I was going to stick with this professor gig. I wasn't, I wasn't sure if it would be a good idea to go be a professor. I wanted to keep my options open. Uh-huh. So I, I, got, I got this internship at Schlumberger Well Services here in Austin, Texas. Uh, okay. Yeah. Now, yeah. great place. They, they had an Austin Research Center. And they, what they wanted was for somebody, me, to go interview software developers and get a sense of mm. how, how they were using their code base and basically why they weren't reusing other people's codes. Like they would just keep reinventing the wheel instead of looking in this code library to, to, to pull in somebody else's solution. Interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it was, it was what I, what I discovered is working is not that interesting. Watching other people work is just fascinating because they're, <laughs> Sorry, right. <laughs> they 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 are always solving problems. They're always trying to figure out how to make the system work better for them, not necessarily for everybody else, but for them. And uh, they 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 have all of these hacks and workarounds that uh, sometimes they learned them from watching other people. Sometimes they taught them to themselves. And I I started realizing that 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 in an environment like this, there is just suffused with texts. They have all of these texts doing all of these different things. So I, I left Austin at, at the end of that summer with a couple of things, a deep love for Austin. I thought it was amazing. I was like, man, I've got to get back there someday, which happened. Mm-hmm. And a deep love for qualitative research, just, just sitting with people, looking at what they did, talking with them about it, and then doing it over and over again and trying to see patterns. And it's that, that kind of joy that I wanted to get across in Topside. It, that joy kind of, I don't want to say it gets bleached away when you're, when you're doing a, a, a research, um, when you're writing a research paper, but there's, there's boundaries to it. And I, I wanted people to be able to see, you know, this is fascinating. This is interesting work. Uh, I, I, and, uh, you know, I've spent so much time explaining this stuff to undergraduates and getting them excited about it, too, that I, that I wanted that to come out in a book. And I think it does. It, 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 to me, it did. Right. And I'm, I'm yeah, no stranger to research, but I really liked the approach to it. And I liked how you broke down qualitative research. And it's very human to human research. Yeah far more interesting to me than just data research but so you 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 talk about um 
the interaction with people. Now, how, how does that change how they do things? Are you affecting change when you're interacting and just the fact you're asking questions of them? Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, there, and there's a well-documented uh, uh, effect, uh, which just went right out of my head. Um, the, the name of it, but there's a name. For I know it. and it just went out of my head and I know the one you're talking about. That's all right. It's, <laughs> it's in the book. You, it's everybody, in the book. Yeah. You're going to have to buy the book to find out. But, yeah. but the, but the idea is, is that when you're watching people do stuff, they change what they do. Yes. Uh, the, the, uh, the, that's, that's the negative. And, and you, I've, I've seen sometimes, especially when people are clearly sort of performing for me where they'll turn to me and explain to me what they're doing. And I'm like, you don't have to do that. Uh, Sometimes at at, at some point that sort of wears off and usually it wears off like sometime during the observation. My uh, one of my, my studies that I, the, the, the one that I I based uh, the book network on where I'm going through the telecommunications company, I was really blessed there because they trained people by just having them sit at their elbow and watching them. So they were used to somebody being there and they had, they had no shame. This one guy, uh, <laughs> I remember doing this observations. One guy was, w- took a, a personal phone call and uh-huh. uh, it was with his wife. They'd just gotten married. When he started calling her like, honey boo or something like that. I was like, you know what? I'm going to take a walk. This is, this has got really uncomfortable for me. He's a little too comfortable. Right. A too personal. Yeah. But so, so, you know, the bottom line is you, you just kind of have to sort of feel people out. You have to realize that they are, they, they are, they know that you're there that, and also that they're human beings with their own agendas. So when they, when they give you, when, when you interview them and they give you uh, uh, answers, they're 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 going to be talking about it from their point of view, and with their own interests in mind. Uh, the 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 way to deal with that is number one to realize that that's the case, but number two, to interview all the people around them too, and to triangulate those interviews with each other, compare them with each other, compare them with the observations, compare them with the texts you've picked up, and uh, you'll you'll always find divergences. Uh, but you also find convergences and, you know, both of those are important. Being able to curate those to build that larger picture is, is important. One what, what of the things that you mentioned just a minute ago, and I want to kind of back up and, yeah. and, uh, and ask you a question about, because it, it just, it triggered my mind. Yeah. So in one company you had talked about, they were quite comfortable, but they had gone through their onboarding and their training practice was one of a journeyman to apprentice, yeah. right? So they were used to that, that connection, one-on-one connection and that high, high dialogue, right? Whereas other companies, it might be the situation where you walk into the company and it's like, yeah, I expect you to know what you're doing. You're going to go have to sink or swim on your own, Yeah, right? You're on your own. So that, that is an interesting study, I think. Oh, absolutely. Now you've been you've been doing this for 25 years. So did that factor in? Did you look at how they how the social dynamic of the company was too and how that interplayed? I, I spend a lot of time trying to map that out based on the stuff that I could see. I mean, obviously right. in, in that particular instance, uh, I had some uh, discussions with uh, higher end um, executives in order to get permission to do this research, that's right. usually not the case. Uh, I usually are, am in, in small organizations. So you have like one decision maker who says, sure, you can do this. And they, they typically are not that concerned about it, but that telecommunications company, they definitely were. And um, uh, you know, part of what they were telling me is, well, we're really interested in, in training because we want to go to a new training model. And uh, so why don't you investigate training. And so that's part of what I did, but it's not, Mm. it wasn't all of it. Mm -hmm. And I I definitely found that the view from the C-suite was definitely not the view from down in the soup. Uh, There there were some really interesting differences. Uh, And, you know, again, it's not like they were were trying to lie to me. It's just, they were telling me what they saw. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, traveling up and down that organization traveling through the layers of the hierarchy, you're going to see a lot of really weird stuff. Um, did that answer your question? Oh yeah. Let me just 
pull back and say, when you really get into an organization, you realize that people don't always see their goals in the same way. They don't think they have the same goals. And that sort of deforms their behavior as well. And uh, that that's one of the, the, the most fascinating things, seeing them uh, pull across these different goals or objectives that they have. Mm-hmm. And now you're, you're collecting all that as part of your data points. That's the thing is like, you know, when you, you, you want to get top site, but you get right down into the soup of it. Yeah. <laughs> right. There's yeah. a lot of gathering of information that you do um, when you're doing qualitative. Mm-hmm. So you're looking at the, inf- the, the, the main objective is to look for what information, how it flows through the company. Yeah, that's right. It's and it's it, it's sometimes inflected differently in different studies, but that's that's the basic thing. Like, how are people communicating? How they how are they coordinating? How are they collaborating? And those are three really different things. Uh, mm-hmm. Communicating being, you know, I talk to you, you talk to me, we exchange some sort of information. Coordinating, we've got different efforts, and they have to mesh together at some point. So if you're mm-hmm. thinking about like. Um, uh, like, let's say I'm at a four-way stop with, with someone else and uh, the communicating, I might be like, go on, or, you know, coordinating, we might uh, uh, try to figure out like who was here first and then uh, collaborating, actually collaborating doesn't work for this, this illustration. <laughs> collaborating is where you both have the same objective and you're both contributing to it, but it's the it's the objective that you're 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 trying to get to together, right? And, and uh, uh, so all communi- all all, um, all companies, people communicate. Most of them they coordinate, or otherwise they're sort of a mess. And most of them they collaborate. They have some sort of objective that they're trying to reach together. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's become more complicated over the last fifty years because. We've gone from uh, department organized work to cross-functional work where we're trying to get people in from different specialties to work together. And they really often see that, that objective differently and sort of probing how they see it, what they think is supposed to happen, what their view is from their particular field or discipline. That, that's where you get the really interesting stuff and where you really have to compare those interviews to, to, to figure out what, what do they think they're doing. It's often not the same thing. Yeah, no, especially when you've got cross, cross uh, collaboration. Yeah, because sometimes they're cross purposes, right? And and the disciplines are different. Yeah, 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 and you you've got this. Uh, okay. Uh, this is where we get into all edge territory. My my 2015 book, because you 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 start seeing this these real differences as as we head into the 90s, where communication got a lot cheaper, so it right. became it became easier to uh, to to crosswire the organization, but it also became really easier to um, uh, to uh, take stuff that wasn't core to the organization and outsource it. So. Now you have to work with uh, the contractors you've, f- to whom you've, you've outsourced work. And uh, th- that, that means that they haven't really you know, soaked in what the organization is trying to do, that they haven't soaked in all of that tacit knowledge. I'll give you a really quick example. In the early 90s, I interned for a computer manufacturer in Dallas. Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, so I was you know, writing software manuals. We had an in-house graphic designer who would design the the the, the covers, mm-hmm. and so I, I was like, "Well, what do you think of work here?" She says, "You know, it's kind of lonely. I'm the only graphic designer here, so I don't really have any other graphic designers to talk to. I can guarantee you that if that company is still in business, she's not on staff there anymore. Uh, they've they've outsourced that out to to a graphic design firm. It's just easier for them." graphic designers get to stay there like stay with each other Mm -hmm. uh the the company gets to to pull on their expertise only when they need it but that means that there's not necessarily as much continuity there's not much um 
a tacit understanding of what this organization is trying to convey. They have to find ways to make it explicit. Yeah, that's... when you lose, um, uh, just because I'm thinking about it, there's a danger of institutional knowledge loss yes. as well, because that's rarely documented. 100%. And sometimes it's not documentable. Uh, the, w- what yeah. we see in organizations is that um, a lot of this stuff just, just kind of runs on this sort of tacit understanding. And once you start trying to make it explicit, it becomes too, uh, it becomes too brittle. Right. Uh, yeah. 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 Th- yeah. This, this, I'm going to go off on a tangent here just because I'm, I'm so excited about it, but okay. <laughs> so pull it back. <laughs> Right, right after I did my dissertation research, I, I cracked open a book that I had, that I had received um, and just hadn't gotten to take a look at. It was a book called Contextual Design by Byron Holtzblatt. And as I started reading it, I was like, son of a bitch, they, they did exactly what my dissertation was trying to do. Uh, they, they, they talked about oh. going into organizations, modeling how people work. Uh-huh. examining it in different ways. I mean, it sounds a lot like topside, honestly, uh, but there was a big difference. And it took me a while to sort of process it and, and figure out what that difference was. And, and, and the difference was that, that their idea was to do this requirements gathering, to go through the organization, looking at people's idiosyncratic ways of solving problems, uh, compile them together, put them into one single interface, and then the idea was, well, we've got those problems solved. Uh, you don't have to have your sticky notes anymore or your lists or the other things that you do to make your business work. And that, that idea, that business processing reengineering idea from the 90s didn't work that well in that sort of pure implementation, uh, simply because uh, the, 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 the company is not static. Right. You know, new yeah. people coming right. in, they have new understandings, they have new tools, they have, they, they're working in a business environment that's constantly changing, you have mm-hmm. new technologies coming up. So people continue to improvise and they continue to sort of bring in these, these, these hacks that they get from somewhere else. And I think well, of it, like, a, go ahead. Sorry, I, but one of the things I really liked, you know, from the, out of the gate in your book is that you're comparing an organization to an organism. Like, it's yeah. like, it is a full living system. So, you know, just taking that shift and thinking of it as something that has life and breath and it changes just like the, like living organisms do. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It absolutely does. And, it, you know, it has, has the same sort of, I don't want to take the metaphor too far, but it has these sort of environmental pressures too. There's stuff mm-hmm. changing all around whatever that organism is. Sometimes we think of these, these organisms as like beach balls floating, floating in the surf. You know, they're just, they're just not touched by anything else, but they really interpenetrate each other. And uh, because of that, you, you get, you get all of this, um, this traffic. Uh, so, so, you know, I mentioned that, that people come up with their own hacks and solutions. They often bring them in from elsewhere right. and they start kind of piling them up. And every once in a while, you get to the point where that, that stack of solutions just kind of falls apart. Just, you know, just like any stack of thing that you put together. Yes. And uh, so it's usually at those points that they really start wanting to find some way to revolutionize their work. And I, I think in, at, a, at a point like that, maybe a BPR, business process reengineering solution is a good idea, but it has to keep that flexibility built in. And I think that's, um, I think that's what, what we found like, you know, in the early 2000s, we kind of moved towards a, a, a tool belt approach in, instead of a, a single system approach. And, and that's, you know, that's where we are now. Uh, we, we use software from all different places and, and figure out how to cobble it together. So, and I think, um, uh, well, it, it, so uh, I don't want to cut to the end of it, but I think the, the purpose of this, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, is that we want to do this deep dive and this analysis to look at these things that all these people are doing, all of all of these people within this organization 
to communicate and how that flows and all their different hacks that they've created because not everybody's the same. Right. So that we can then what? Come up with the top site, right? Is we're going deep into mm-hmm. the into the into the weeds so then that we, we can compile, right? Right. Then we pull back, we get we get to see the 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 entire system and we get we get to see these these uh, persistent stress points, these these contradictions yeah. where where parts of the organization uh, just are not figuring it out. And uh, the, w- once we can do that, we, we can really start kind of figuring out, well, where do we intervene? Where would it be best to intervene? And you know, the thing, I got all passionate here because that's, that's an exciting moment when you realize yeah. that all of this stuff kind of stacks up and you can put a name to the problem. Once you can put a name to the problem, you can start thinking about how to solve it. Uh, the uh, the last section of the book, which is in Top Site 2.0, it's not in the the original Top Site, which I wrote in 2013. I revised it in 2018. Uh, mm-hmm. That last section is really about how do you how do you take your idea for a solution and turn it into something that's actually going to work? How do you road test it and how do you get people's feedback on it? Because uh, e- even though you've you've reached what you think is Top Site. It's really easy to say, okay, I've got the solution. We're going to implement it tomorrow, and everything will be great. Uh, there's there's plenty of stuff that that you don't necessarily know about, and uh, just implementing a solution unilaterally could break uh, processes that that run through that. So being able to to test it using participatory design techniques and lever your way up to to a more organic solution that people are on board with that's mm-hmm. a huge deal. Um, I will, and I'm going to get, tell you another story. This is from the telecommunications company. Mm-hmm. They, they had one of those centralized solutions uh, where all of their customers were in a database. Uh, their, their infrastructure was in that database and you needed anything on anybody or anything. You just look at the database. When I went to uh, one unit, local provisioning, what I realized is that when, when they were ready to, to kind of build out the network to, to meet the needs of one specific customer, they mm-hmm. would print out stuff from that database and they would stick it in a folder, like a manila folder, and then they would move it from desk to desk as they were processing. And at the end of the process, they would key it back into the database. They, they, were, they basically were like, we're, we're opting out of this. Uh, that the, this omnibus solution, mm-hmm doesn't work for us. Here's what we're going to do instead. And, and I, think, I think that that's what you get when you design a solution and you don't, you don't get that sort of input or that buy-in from the people who are, who are working with it. Uh, so that's, that's what Topside is there to, to, to avoid. So did yeah. you see that too? Hold on. So did you see that too with the, um, we were talking earlier about how you went to observe software developers. Why are you writing your own code? Was it similar? It was. We're going to do it for ourselves. Oh, that was so fascinating. It was, it was more that they just didn't know it was there and uh, they, they didn't have a good way to, to search the code base to figure out what solutions people had done. I mean, that, that code base was global. It had uh, more lines than, um, yeah. Uh, Microsoft Windows did at that time, so it was a huge, huge, yeah. huge, huge uh, uh, code base. And uh, without being able to to search it, they couldn't figure out what was there. But also, you would find sometimes that when an individual was dealing with a problem, they would conceptualize it differently from the other individuals. And when you conceptualize it, you write it into code. Somebody else has to figure out your concept. And sometimes they, they just right. were like, I'm not going to do that. You know, that doesn't work for what I'm trying to do. And so you right, have this right. weird proliferation. Interesting. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead, Janice. I, I didn't mean to diverge too far. <laughs> Your curiosity got the better of you. It did. I can't help it. <laughs> but it, And it's down to those. It's, it's the same thing with the communi- communication channels and how we communicate. Mm-hmm. People have their own their own adaptive style right they do and i th- and i think i i think that one thing okay so i'm sorry i'm gonna get a little professory 
when we talk about writing, I'm a professor of rhetoric and writing, right? So, so when we think <laughs> about writing, it, you know, it's the most flexible tool that we have, but, yeah. we tend, but we tend to think of it as one thing, like I know how to write. And when it's really a stack of skills, it's a stack of skills that we start learning as soon as we're born. Like when your parents read to you, you start getting used to the idea uh, of this, this bizarre idea that you can take something temporal, like speaking, and turn it into something spatial, marks on a page. And uh, so as we go through school, we build these, these different skills. Those, those, those skills don't stop once, once we're done with high school. Yeah. We, we learn them into college. And afterwards, uh, there's a lot of uh, studies now on lifelong learning. And what you have is this huge stack of skills that they're all sort of interrelated. Uh, none of us is a master of every skill there. There's, there's certain points where we didn't quite get it and we sort of hard, we sort of cross wire around it, but that's, that's a lot of information. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and so we use writing in lots and lots of different ways. Um, my father, when he was alive, uh, would call me about once a year and he would say something like this, well, Clay, you're a professor of writing. Have you found that your students are worse about worse uh, writers than before because they've just been texting? Do you see text speak? And I'm like, no, dad, they are writing in more modes than ever before. And they are switching okay. from mode to mode and they're, they're mastering more media. And he was like, huh. And then I could almost hear him forgetting the conversation immediately because it didn't really fit his preconceptions. So right. we'd have a conversation again <laughs> yeah. like next time. But that, I think I think that's I think that's the thing. We're we're being asked to write mm. and read in a lot more modes now. Uh, communication has gotten cheaper, so people are on Slack, they're on Teams, they're they're um, um, they're writing emails of various lengths, and uh, they're 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 just not mastering all of all of those different modes, it's, it's really hard. Um, I think um, a, a big part of it is that when, I'm gonna talk about pre and versus post COVID now, okay? okay. Pre COVID, uh, when you're working on something creative where you, you have to, you have to uh, uh, poll people on short notice, you could mm -hmm. work in an open plan environment and then you could just ask somebody it would drive people yeah. crazy because you would interrupt them. Mm -hmm. But you have this, uh, what they call mutual adjustment. Uh, that mutual adjustment is harder to do when everybody's on Zoom because you're not on a Zoom call all the time. And I think that's why we've uh, pushed towards Slack, Teams, Discord, and other instant messaging. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's, uh, it, it does break people's flow. And uh, that sort of that, that, that time management piece that, or productivity piece where you erect boundaries around your time and figure out how to, how to protect that while, while still uh, engaging in mutual adjustment, that's, that, that, that's, uh, I think that's one of our major challenges. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I can see you feel this deeply. I do. I do too. I mean, yeah. I actually, I actually turned off Slack and Discord before we started this conversation because I was like, <laughs> I, I can't, I can't have somebody bothering me right now. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh -huh. Oh, I, for for me, I've worked remote for so long, but yeah. it, it's very different yeah. when somebody's in in the home with me and that interruption. It's a very different energy. It is. And it, 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 psychologists tell me, I'm not a psychologist, but psychologists tell me that, that it actually takes energy to, yes. to, to refocus yes. and it takes, it takes time. And yes. uh, so, so, you know, putting yourself in a position, w one thing that, that, that I suggest to people is that they spend some time kind of watching how they work and figuring out a, a heat map for here's when I do my, my deep concentration. Here's when I'm more distractible. Here's when I'm tired. And then figuring out how do you block those out so, so that you can do your deep productive tasks at, at a certain point and then do your mop-up tasks the rest of the day. 
and it's I, I think I think something like that is is really crucial, but it doesn't always work well with everybody else in the organization. You know, mm-hmm. if your boss calls a, a meeting at 8 a.m., you can't say, I'm sorry, that's my my deep work time. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll see you at two. Yeah. <laughs> so, I think I think I think meetings can be. Well, sure. OK. Yeah, I shouldn't rant about that, but meet, meetings have their uses. But I think we over meet and we over uh, message each other, and we send out too many emails. Uh, it being more intentional and you know, kind of figuring out what what sorts of boundaries we can set up, I think is extremely important. And I, I think that's something that 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 I see when I'm when I'm. Um, when I'm uh, going into these organizations right. is that they, they haven't really deeply thought about that kind of stuff. And so it's, it, it's all kind of like throwing spaghetti at the wall. Um, and you, you have these systems that, that start to endure and, and become uh, more official, but they're, they're not always designed, if that makes sense. Right, well, the over meeting thing. <clears throat> yeah. Right. And everybody complains yeah. about we have too many meetings, too many meetings, and yet they have more meetings. And then they meet to talk about their meetings. Oh, God. Are you in my department? Okay. Holy <laughs> God. Oh, sorry. I think, <laughs> I think that's I think those organizations probably could do with uh, some somebody coming in and doing some research, getting some yeah. top site. Yeah, so absolutely. Look Give at my the number flow of communication because you need to have that balance of alone time and together time. And you can't, it's a tricky thing to balance those. Yeah, you, yeah. Have, you have to have clear goals. You have to have some intentionality. You, and you have to have scaffold their way to get there. And I think this is, this is a big deal. I spent a lot of time, and it's not just because I'm a writing professor, but I spent a lot of time talking about the texts that people are moving around the organization. Uh-huh. Uh, sometimes we think about information as if like, Oh, it's just something, some intention that flies through the ether. But whenever we talk about information, we're talking about uh, some communication in some sort of medium. Usually, right. it's in text. Sometimes it's mm-hmm. spoken, but it's but it's still it's still a thing, and right. it's still physical. It's and, words uh, strung together, or yeah, words and pictures, right? Or yeah, diagrams, or or whatever. Mm-hmm. You're you're communicating something and, and being able to kind of track how how those physical things move around the organization is is huge uh, w- once once you start thinking about that you can start thinking about the composition of those particular things what you know I gave you the example a while back of the um, uh, of them printing out the database sticking it in the manila folder and then moving that around mm-hmm. uh, which is kind of a costly way to way of doing things. We often find uh, that that people have not sort of bundled these texts together that well. So you have texts kind of flying around right. everywhere, and that's you know I'm just describing everybody's uh, email inbox, right? You know, some somebody thinks of something, they email it, then they think of something else, and they email that out too. And I think really Slack uh, or Discord, Discord is even even worse because it just gets more atomized. Uh, being able to f- kind of figure out uh, patterns and how to put those patterns together is critical. Are, can I give you a slightly long-winded story? I love your stories. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, good. Well, this <laughs> so, is not- I, and I honestly, I, you know, well, because I, I believe teaching with fables, so yeah, I, it's a great way of teaching. It's one of the most effective teaching techniques is the storytelling. It- Oh, I'm so, I'm so glad to hear that. Well, well this, yeah. this story is not from me. It's from a guy named Charles Bazerman. And uh, he wrote a book in 1988 called Shaping Written Knowledge. And part of what he did was to go into the archives of the Royal Society of England. Uh, mm-hmm. th- this is where the, uh, the genre of the experimental article came from. So if you've ever had to write a, a, a lab report, it's, you know, it's the same, it's IMRAD format, introduction, methods, results, mm-hmm. analysis, discussion. And you may have been like, well, this makes a lot of sense. Of course, you want to separate these things. That was not clear at the beginning. At the beginning of the Royal right. Society, was, it was mostly noble men, you know, noble, aristocrats, men, always, unfortunately. Uh, the guys who had their country manners 
and who had a lot of money and a lot of time on their hands. Right. And, and, and so they, they would be like, oh, I want to be a scientist. So they would hear about something, let's say the vacuum pump. They'd be like, well, that sounds dope. I'm going to order me a vacuum pump. And then they're like, what am I going to do with it? I'll put, my, I'll put this mouse in it and then I'll pump out all the air and see what happens. So this is like the level of bored teens putting gerbils in a microwave. It's, it's like that, that, kind, that kind of science. So they yeah. would see this, whatever this, you know, their, their mouse died. So they would write it up and they'd send it to the Royal Journal. So another nobleman would read this letter and go, oh, I'm going to do this too. He tries it. His mouse doesn't die. And so he'd get furious about it and write this angry letter. My mouse didn't die. So they had to start doing things like, like giving detailed instructions. Okay, here's how I did this. There's your method section. They had to separate out the results. Uh, you know, here's what happened. And then the interpretation, the analysis, here's what I think it means. And then they had to start talking about previous literature. Uh, so, so these parts that, that we're familiar with, those came out really over a very long period of time as these people were just trying to settle disputes about fact. The, now, the, the thing about it is that now that we have the genre of the experimental article, uh-huh. it's easy to teach. And right. if you just follow the moves, you, you find that you're, you're able to, to, to do science. I mean, you do, sci- it's kind of like a paint by numbers. You just do science right. by making sure you're filling out these pattern. sections correctly. Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 and the, that, that kind of, that, that idea of a, a genre, the experimental article being sort of a cultural heritage that, that uh-huh. people, people pick up and then they enact, that's, that's really powerful. Uh, I, I, I've seen this most recently in, um, uh, startup pitch presentations, which I, I, I studied like the first half of this decade, first half of last decade. Well, some decade. Yeah, some decade. So we back in the back. <laughs> yeah. So the, the, these, these people were like engineers or inventors. They didn't know the first thing about entrepreneurship, but they'd have to put together these pitch decks and they'd have to, re- and they, they were suddenly like, oh, I have to articulate a problem. And, uh, a market for whom it's a problem. And, and you, they're, they're, they're just sort of being led through seeing things like an entrepreneur just because they had to put a pitch deck together. And I, that was the birth of the pitch deck. That's mm, no, no, that was, that, that was them learning the pitch deck. The birth of the pitch deck really came from a uh, business plan. And that was in like the early two thousands. Uh, but, but once it was there, people found it to be really easy to, to, to learn. And as they're learning the genre, they're learning how to be the entrepreneur. That's, I think that's a really the, the key thing. So, so when we think about uh, redesigning uh, texts or information flow in an organization, yeah. it's a good idea to start thinking in terms of, well, how do we design this, this experience so that people don't have to know everything in order to dive in? How, right. how, how can we lead them in so that they can they can do the sorts of uh, communication that they need to. Right. It's kind of like, how can we lead them in like the journeyman to apprentice so that they have that, that yeah. intimate, they can get that intimate relationship uh, more expediently. So that communication flows more effective. My mind is just blown when I talk with you. It's 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 this this I mean this is why I wrote Top Site 2.0. It's it's yeah. it's so exciting to be able to think through this stuff and to pull it back and see it from a different perspective. The, the one thing I want to add, um, we talked a little bit about the beginning of the process where you gather all of this information and yes. the end of the process where you have a solution. Uh, and, and the middle part of the process is really important because you know you have all of this information, and if you just if you just try to intuit from that information what's happening, uh, you're you're going to have a lot of uh, uh, biases. You're you're yeah. yeah yeah. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Keep keep talking. I'm like yeah. I wanted to talk to you about biases. Go ahead. <laughs> oh sure. No, so 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 what I have people do in the middle part of top site is to take all of these data and start yeah. looking at them from different angles and filling out different models. And those, there's nothing magical about those models. They're just kind of 
they're, they're kind of like that experimental article or that pitch deck. They focus you on one particular type of phenomenon, like where are people handing stuff off or yeah. what all information do people gather together in order to make something happen. And uh, uh, the, once you run things through these different models, you can see them through all these different lenses and then you can reintegrate them. So much, it, it's so important to be able to do that rather than just to, to just follow people around and then sort of intuit what's happening. Yeah, I, I must confess, we don't have very much time. I, I, have, I, have, the, I have the most recent version. And I'm at Coding Artifacts. I didn't get, I didn't yeah. finish the book all the way it's because it's really interesting. Oh, sure. I really, I really, I highly recommend yeah. if anyone wants to do data analysis of any kind from any discipline, like if you've got to do a, where you're observing people, I think your book is phenomenal because you have That's a lot of the safety things that you need to think about and the considerations that you need to think about. If you're going in and you're interacting with people in this day and age, you yeah. have to consider your own personal safety. Mm -hmm. Like there's a lot in, in the book and it, you really have a lot of anecdotes, which I love. Yeah. And a lot of stories and a lot of ways of looking at things a little differently. And I was fascinated when, we were when you were talking about artifacts. I'm like, artifacts? Okay, so you're like really talking about literally everything that's on their desk, what's in their bookshelf, yeah. what, you know, all the things that surround them. And you're yeah. making notes of all of this. So I got to the coding part of it. Yeah. So I can't wait to get to, because I know like all of this, you go deep down in and then you need to pull up from that. But how you pull up from that, you can't just like um, intuit things. Oh yeah, it's so important. Right. Be, 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 some sometimes, and this has happened to me multiple, multiple times. I'll I'll uh, I'll be interviewing a bunch of people, and then one person says something that really resonates with me, and I'm like, "Yeah, that's how it works." And then you know, later on, I have to do that systematic comparison through the data, and I realize, "Oh no, that's how this works for this one person." And right. just just because I'm simpatico with that one person does not mean that's how that's how everybody sees it. It's right. fascinating. Right. Uh, so yeah, I think, I think, I think coding is when we talk about coding data, really what we're talking about is just hanging descriptors on it. I, I, I said, it's, it's kind of like hashtagging. I, like I loved that part. It's like hashtags. <laughs> yeah. That, I was, I was like, how do I describe this? And I was scrolling hashtags. Twitter and I'm like, Oh, there it is. There well, you know, is. and that's the evolution of communication now. Like, you know, yeah. if you said hashtag 20 years ago, people would be like, what? Yeah. Hashtags were not in the first edition of this book. Right. The second edition. I'm like, there it is. And that's that how, you know, communication has evolved as a society. And then you go into companies and, and that yeah. is also feeds into how, how companies communicate. Oh, absolutely. How authors author, how we communicate as we technical had... writers, how we communicate. Right. Because and the public has changed. They understand hashtags or they try to. Yeah. The public has changed. There's. There, there's of course generational differences. Uh, there's, yeah, yeah. The, you, you know, you talk to Gen X versus millennials. They, they just have very different. I, I don't want to be, you know, broad, too broad brushed, but definitely different priorities. And I think uh, the Gen Z is about to, to hit the workforce, and they're going to have a completely different take on things. So there, there's a lot of stuff that we just kind of took for granted, like. Uh, uh, like dress codes in workplaces and mm -hmm. hierarchies that that are they're just really destabilized now. Mm -hmm. So I I have a master's student I talked to this morning who's who's talking about dress codes and uh, and and she and she she had this sort of breakthrough. She was she was like, yeah, there's plenty of things wrong with dress codes, and a big thing is that the uh, the managers will often say, well, just use your use your best judgment and dress appropriately. And she's like, that doesn't tell you anything. Yeah. And, and uh, yeah. she says, especially women bear the brunt of that because mm -hmm. they're, 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 they, they, you know, they're, uh, they're historically, they, they've, uh, they've been held to a different standard and, you know, women's uh, clothing is very, very different sort of in, in philosophy than men's clothing. So she, she talked a little bit about, she and I talked this morning about how do you put together a, not a dress code, but a process for getting a fair, equitable dress code, 
fascinating. Yeah, that is very. Yeah. I know, I know I wander off the point a little bit, but I'm just so excited by, by what these students are doing. (laughs) It's exciting. And I really, I think that, oh gosh, my time is up, but, but I really, I really, really, really highly recommend people get the book because it is really a very good book. And it's one you'll have with you forever because I think you approach it as a living organism. And I really like that because out of the gate, it, it shifts your mindset from something that's like so static into it's a living organism. And you have yeah. to look at it like that. You have to treat it as if you're a doctor looking at things and asking questions to, you know, then eventually once you get all your data, look at it from the top side, right? Top side down. That's right. So, Oh, I so really excited. appreciate Thanks. you being here. It has been such a delight talking with you. I can go Absolutely. down all kinds of little rabbit holes with you. I know. <laughs> and we, it's fascinating. It's all very interesting. It's it's so fun. It's it's so fun learning from people and, yeah. and you know, watching people and seeing the things that they they don't quite under, understand about themselves and, and talk, yeah. talking with them about it. It's great. Thank yeah. you so much for having me on. Thanks for being here. Yeah, it has been a pleasure. And thanks, everybody. Until the next time, see ya. Bye. Bye.